My name is Stephen Pinker. I am a cognitive psychologist, and I'm interested in all aspects of human nature, but with a focus on language and cognition. I have explored just about every aspect of the human mind, from irregular verbs to the history of war and peace, anything that has to do with what makes us tick. Probably everything that I have written involves some kind of controversy, not because I'm rearing for a fight, but I find the unsettled issues the most interesting to dive into. Not because I want one side to win and the other side to lose, but because I hope to clarify the terms of the argument, uh, although not always to the satisfaction of both sides. I grew up in Montreal in the English-speaking community, and I went to McGill University, majored in psychology, and my first research activity, and my first publication, uh, was called Schedule-Induced Drinking in Random and Variable Interval Food Reinforcement Schedules, which almost sounds like a parody of an obscure academic paper. But it turns out to touch on some deep issues, both in how the mind works and in the history of the, uh, the study of human nature. This was in a lab on the experimental analysis of behavior, uh, otherwise known as uh, Skinnerian psychology. Some people call it rat and pigeon psychology. Namely, you throw a rat or a pigeon in a box, they're hungry, there is a food hopper, and they learn to push a lever or a peck a key to get a food reward. The background was that this came at the tail end of one of the major schools of thought in uh, psychology called behaviorism, originated by a man named John B. Watson, uh, became famous as the author of a notorious uh, child care manual, founded a school called behaviorism, which was then made even more famous by B.F. Skinner, who spent most of his career at Harvard, where I spent much of my career, and indeed we overlapped by a year when uh, he was very old and I was very young. But according to behaviorism, the subject matter of psychology was not the human mind. It was not uh, thought or emotion or memory. It was behavior. Behaviorism rose as kind of a reaction to some of the excesses of Freudian psychoanalysis that the, the mind is populated with an id and ego and a superego and preconscious and unconscious and libido and uh, eros and thanatos, uh, that little boys have an unconscious desire to copulate with their mothers and a fear of being castrated by their fathers. A lot of kind of exotic uh, attributions to the mind of a, of a little kid without a whole lot of evidence. Uh, in reaction, behaviorism said, forget it. Forget the, the, the Oedipal complex, forget the death wish. In fact, forget beliefs, desires, or any kind of mental content. The idea was that psychology should be a science, and science deals with things you can measure. And mental entities, like thoughts and beliefs and wishes and images and desires and uh, motives, were not things you could measure with an instrument. Therefore, they were like ghosts and spirits and sprites and leprechauns. They were not the proper subject matter of psychology which should only study uh, the stimuli in the environment that a physicist could measure, the responses of an organism, and the laws of learning that determined how an organism would behave depending on its current stimulus situation and its past history of learning. This was captured in a, a couple of laws of learning. There was uh, Pavlovian conditioning, famous from Pavlov's dogs who heard a bell followed by a bit of food, and then eventually came to salivate to the bell. And operant conditioning, where, say, a rat in a box pressing a lever that delivered a food pellet would then start to press the lever over and over again. The idea being that once you identify the laws of learning, they would apply across the board to all stimuli, all responses, all organisms. So if you could nail down the laws of learning with a simple laboratory Preparation, like rats in a box, which the box came to be known as the Skinner box in honor of B.F. Skinner, that's what you needed to know for a science of behavior. And you would do away with all talk of things in the head. And in fact, when you were a behaviorist, and I, I learned this as an undergraduate, um, you learned a whole new way of talking. So even something like, why did Lisa just get up and go to the kitchen? 
Well, she was thirsty and she knew she left a, a can of Coke in the fridge and she wanted a can of Coke. According to a behaviorist, you cannot say that. Uh, you have to say, because uh, want and belief and know and remember, those are all mental terms which you can't measure. Instead, in Lisa's past, when she had been deprived of liquids for a certain number of hours, emitted the behavior of walking to the kitchen, she was reinforced by the reinforcer of a can of Coke in the fridge. It was almost a cult where you learned to describe behavior in a human or in a rat or in a pigeon in that kind of language, nothing uh, in the head. This was a dominant school in psychology. It was starting to fade in the 1970s when I was a, an undergraduate, partly as a result of a withering attack by the linguist Noam Chomsky in the late 1950s, where he pointed out, among other things, that uh, people really aren't rewarded for uh, everything that they do. There isn't any food dispenser in the sky that gives us a little uh, raisin every time we do something. And also the idea that all organisms are interchangeable is clearly false in the case of human language. You have a human child, you have a cat in the same uh, environment, exposed to the same stimuli, no matter what you do to the cat, it's not gonna end up speaking, whereas the child will. Chomsky's critique led to what is known as the cognitive revolution, starting in the late 1950s, gathering steam through the 1970s, where uh, the whole idea of mental life was scientifically rehabilitated. Part of the inspiration came from the theory of computation and information and cybernetics. Thanks to the development of real thinking machines, the first digital computers and the first artificial intelligence, showed that uh, internal representations, images, rules, plans, goals, states, weren't airy-fairy mystical ghosts. They were actually configurations of mechanism. Now, if a computer can have a rule or an image or a goal, why should it be unscientific to say that a human uh, had them? This led to the new field of cognitive psychology and other uh, allied fields like linguistics, artificial intelligence, philosophy of mind, neuroscience. That confederation was called cognitive science. And as an undergraduate, this uh, excited me tremendously. I knew this is what I wanted to do, to study the mind scientifically. What could be more fascinating? But my first job came in a uh, rat and pigeon lab, and I wanted the research experience, and I enjoyed getting into the mental discipline of the whole system of thinking like a behaviorist with its very strict uh, rules. And even though I myself didn't believe it, I wanted to be able to understand it and master it. And I wanted experience in a, in a real lab. Well, in response to the criticism that people are not given little food morsels for everything they do, I mean, Skinner was no fool. He anticipated that and many other criticisms. And he noted that uh, reinforcement, informally what we call reward, uh, is intermittent. You don't have to get a uh, food pellet every time you press the lever, if you're the rat, even if you get it every 10 presses or once every uh, 30 seconds, the lever is connected and give, gives you food. The rat can learn that contingency and the rat will then press the lever even if the food is not forthcoming. And of course, that's kind of the way life is. Uh, we aren't rewarded for everything we do, but sooner or later, the, the things we do will, will uh, work to our advantage. So these are called schedules of reinforcement. And there's a huge amount of research on the different ways in which rewards could be distributed uh, over time as a way of explaining why people didn't have to get uh, rewarded for everything they did. Now, scientists will often pursue some unexpected quirk or surprise. And one of them was that when you have a rat in a box and it doesn't get rewarded with every lever press, but uh, several seconds go by before the lever is uh, connected, the rat will often just drink itself silly with water, not booze, but the, the rat will drink and drink and drink and drink. There was no explanation either from common sense or from uh, behaviorism. And there was a flurry of research activity to understand schedule-induced polydipsia, excess drinking. And that's what I was assigned to work on as a, an undergraduate. My advisor, my boss, J.R. Jock Millinson, 
had a lab, and he had become mildly famous for inventing a new schedule of reinforcement called random interval schedules of reinforcement. This is to be contrasted with variable interval schedules of reinforcement, which every student at the time uh, was familiar with. Now, in those days, uh, this was before there were personal computers or microcomputers. To run a lab, you had a rack of apparatus with counters and timers and relays and spaghetti of wires. And to set up the Skinner box so that the rat would get a food pellet at variable uh, intervals of time, there's actually a punched paper tape on a loop that went around slowly, uh, turned by a motor. And there was a, a little finger that could drop into a hole, punched into the paper tape, and you'd go punch, punch, punch uh, at different intervals. Sometimes it would be five seconds, and sometimes 10 seconds, and the loop would repeat. And that was what the technology permitted. And Jock Nolenson noted that that isn't exactly random, because it means that there is a minimum time out the distance between the two closest holes in the, in the tape, in which the rat knows that pressing the lever isn't going to get him any food. Now, of course, if you're a behaviorist, uh, it would be a mortal sin to talk about what the rat knows and doesn't know. But you know, to be honest, that's kind of the way behaviorists would talk to each other on the side. Uh, in public, they would stifle themselves because uh, that broke all the rules. But the rat knew that uh, after getting a pellet, there's going to be a period in which the, uh, the lever was just not going to work. The rat was hungry, the rat was bored, the rat was nudgy, and there's nothing to do but drink. And so the rat did, the rat did drink. That was the theory. The idea was if you could eliminate that, that, that interval, that time out, then uh, maybe you would wipe out this puzzling drinking. And a, so a purely random interval schedule of reinforcement would not have this paper tape with its minimum time out, but it would be every instant there would be some small probability that the lever would work. This is what statisticians call a Poisson process, namely an event that occurs with no memory and the same probability at every instant in time. The challenge was, how do you actually implement it? Because you can't do it with that, that the paper tape. Well, Jacques Millinson had one of the first mini computers in a psychology lab. This was a state-of-the-art technology at the time. It was about the size of a phone booth, far less computational power than a beeper in a birthday card nowadays, but it was uh, very impressive for those days. Even then, it was beyond the capability of this powerful computer at the time to generate random, uh, randomly timed pulses. Um, and so Jock invented a, a gadget with an itty bitty little bit of radioactive isotope and an itty bitty little Geiger counter. And at every moment of time, if there was a bit of radioactive decay, it would uh, trigger the Geiger counter, uh, connect the lever to the food hopper, and at that moment, the rat, the, uh, rat could get a reward. And uh, sure enough, it wiped out the drinking, and I had my first publication. But what was of interest is the statistical law that made that possible. It ended up, in the way that ideas often do, connecting to very different ideas that were relevant to my interests at very different stages uh, of my life. The thing about a Poisson process, a purely random process, is that events seem to cluster. Now, this is a bit of a paradox. I got this from one of my uh, math teachers uh, as a way of appreciating it. Imagine, take a, a quintessentially random process lightning bolts. Let's say, Every day, there is a 3% chance that your house will be struck by a bolt of lightning. Therefore, there's about one lightning strike per month on average. Let's say lightning strikes today. Which day of the month is the most likely one to have the next strike? Now, I've given this out as a questionnaire. Almost everyone gets it wrong. They think, well, you know, average 30 days. Well, I don't know, maybe 15 days. The answer is tomorrow. Tomorrow? Why tomorrow? Well, think about it. Okay, the event, the lightning strikes are random. If there's a 3% uh, chance every day, that means there's a 3% chance that, it'll, that the next uh, strike will be tomorrow. What are the chances that the next day, uh, the next strike will be the day after tomorrow? Well, when you think about it, two things have to happen. Number one, there has to be a lightning strike the day after tomorrow. Number two, there can't be a lightning strike tomorrow. If there were, tomorrow would be the next day. So it's uh, 0.97 times 0.03. Well, what about two days from tomorrow? Well, for that to happen, the probability is even lower. Namely, no strike tomorrow, no strike the day after tomorrow, strike the third day. 
you get an exponentially decaying probability that the next strike will be farther and farther out, with the paradoxical result that if the process is totally random, tomorrow is the most likely day. Just like with the rats in the box, if you just got a food pellet, the most likely time you're going to get the next pellet is now, even though it's at random. Now, rats figure this out. Uh, humans notice the clustering, but we've got these big brains. We think up uh, theories for what happens, unlike the rat. And a lot of people are un fall prey to an illusion that random events, which do cluster, uh, have some pattern to them. Uh, I even discovered this uh, again in uh, the next lab that I worked in, an auditory perception lab, where for completely different reasons, we had people listen for faint sounds over headphones, and they too were generated at random. And we told the people, press a button when you hear a sound, uh, by the way, they're going to happen at random. And some people came out of the, the booth and they said, oh, your random event generator is broken. Uh, the event, the beeps didn't come at random. They were in bursts like beep, 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 beep. And they thought that something was wrong. But that's what randomness sounds like. Now, this has a lot of manifestations, not only in exposing the pattern-seeking ability of the human brain, which often sees patterns even when there's randomness, but in making sense of uh, other events. And this popped up uh, decades later when I wrote a book on history of violence, one of whose chapters was on the history of war. And the question is, why are there periods in history in which wars seem to occur a lot? Is it because war is contagious? If there's just been one, then there's likely to be another one. Uh, are there periods in which humans are just more uh, bellicose? Well, the answer, according to statisticians, was that there is no patterning to wars uh, over time, to the fine-grained uh, distribution. War is a Poisson process, uh, just like the rats in the box, just like the people in the booth. Even if they're randomly timed, it's going to seem like they come in clusters unless there is some non-random process that spaces them out. And so it uh, alerted me not to get fooled by the fact that often wars came in close succession, World War II, partition of India, Chinese Civil War. That may mean nothing in particular. It's what you would expect if wars were timed at random. One other twist, though, is that even when events are timed at random, the probabilities can change. That is, instead of it being, say, a 3% chance at every moment, there could be a 1% chance. What I ended up concluding, based on the uh, data available to me, part of a bigger pattern, is that the, even though the year-by-year -year timing of wars was random, the overall chance of a war was going down. A lot of things that came out of a silly study of rats drinking in a box, but an illustration of the way one idea can be connected to others in ways you wouldn't expect.